I'm Maria. I'm the Director of Development here at the Seward House Museum. All this year, we have been highlighting Seward's 1871 trip around the world. This is the 150th anniversary of that international voyage. Seward was very well traveled. He took four trips abroad throughout his lifetime. He was one of the first Secretaries of State to travel abroad while in office. And this last trip that we focus on this year is the most extensive of the four. He is completely circumnavigating the globe. And we're starting off uh, where we left him at the end of June in Constantinople. Now, at the very end of the month, he meets Sultan Abdulaziz, who is one of the diplomats on display in our upstairs diplomats gallery. You can see that right here. Seward said, the Sultan is a stout, well-formed man, 47 years old, with a pleasing and amiable, though not impressive, countenance. His hair is slightly gray, and he is said to dislike the national fez, which he wears very small. He rides remarkably well, like a soldier accustomed to the saddle. His bland smile when passing our carriages, which indeed he might have known by the imperial livery to be his own, indicated to Mr. Brown that he had the honor of being personally recognized, although he failed in the attempt to flatter Mr. Seward with the belief that he shared in that honor. And so we're picking up in July, Seward is still in Constantinople. And something we're going to see this month and in the couple months we have left is that Seward is reinvigorated by his journey into Western Europe. We see more lively descriptions of the places he's visiting and much more in-depth descriptions of these different cities and countries. So I'm going to be quoting from Seward's travel book quite a bit. Um, but it's in contrast to the descriptions that we saw earlier in the year when Seward was in Asia. And so in the beginning of July in Constantinople, again, like Seward received uh, when he arrived in Turkey, the Turkish Furman, again, from the government, Seward is given permits where he has free access to the city, institutions, museums, all of which would normally be associated with a fee. Seward said, the sea elsewhere is a thing of dread. The sea at Constantinople is a highway of commerce and a pleasure lake. Although dividing the city, it is not forced out by wharves, docks, or piers on either side. It is this peaceful contact of two continents with the truce between an old and new civilization in the Bosporus, and at the same time a control of two seas, both relieved of their terrors while retaining always their placid beauty that makes Constantinople the most delightful place in the world. Seward also spends the 4th of July holiday in Constantinople, he remarks, although the celebration of our national independence has come to be regarded as a commonplace affair at home, it is an enjoyment which citizens of the United States cannot forego without reluctance while abroad. Seward spends the holiday visiting Robert College. It's an American university for the education of Turkish youths. He is welcomed there, congratulated on his arrival in Constantinople. Um, they thank him for his interest in the college, and then Seward gives a speech there before departing. And the following day, July 5th, Seward boards a steamer uh, for his excursion on the Bosporus. That is a canal, a channel which tra traverses the entire length of the capital. And during this time, uh, he has a bit of a mix-up in his schedule. We talked about this a little bit last month when he arrives in the city and there's some confusion about the date of his arrival, so his rooms are not yet ready for him. And he experiences something similar to that uh, in this country. So Seward was invited to be entertained by Kamil Pacha, the president of the Council of State. He also received an invitation from the Sultan. Now they were located uh, on separate ends of the Bosporus and it would be a conflict time-wise to go to both of these places in the same day. They assumed then that Seward would forego the first invitation and only meet the Sultan as he was a higher ranking individual, but Seward wanted to try to do both in one day. And so Seward arrived at his first stop and said, Server Pacha, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, on receiving the Sultan's command that Mr. Seward should be presented today, had assumed that the gentleman would be unable to keep his engagement for the morning with Kamil Pacha and had given notice to him to that effect, but had omitted to inform Mr. Seward. 
So it turned out that while with sharpened appetites and pressed for time, we were wondering why we had no breakfast, Camille Pacha and his wife were equally wondering that we had come there for one. Seward, though, did have a nice visit with them and was able to make his engagement with the Sultan as well. He said his majesty asked about his health. He inquired about his travels up until this point, particularly wanting to hear Seward's story about his time in Japan and China. Um, at this point, Seward is about to depart to Turkey and take off on the Danube. Before that, Seward reflects on his time there, saying, what shall we say of Turkey? Let us say that having seen it, we find it a greater puzzle than before more completely hybrid than any other state that has ever existed. Thus, it has a more difficult political position than any empire has had to maintain, and a geographical position the worst that could be conceived for maintaining. Its own security requires that it shall not only close the passage between two seas, but also dominate on the shores of two continents. Turkey is thus in everybody's way. As I said, Seward takes off, he leaves Turkey, and this is right in the middle of July. He arrives in Hungary, visits Budapest for a very, very short amount of time, and it is here that Seward remarks that he truly feels that he has left the East, he is in Western civilization, and he has entered um, Europe and, and the West. They visit monuments, museums, and palaces there before Seward embarks back on the Danube and heads to Vienna. Um, so at this point, when Seward arrives in Vienna, the Austrian Empire consists of 19 separate states, all differing in language, religion, customs, um, and so it is not a consolidated nation. Seward again is reflecting quite in detail about his impression of Vienna. He says, Vienna is indeed a great city. Its population exceeds three quarters of a million, its accumulated wealth is immense, its manufacture of scientific apparatus, musical instruments, and articles of virtu and luxury is hardly inferior to that of Paris. Banks, railroads, and navigation companies grasp the commerce, not only of the Danube, but of the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and the Levantine. Its churches are built by lavish contributions of dying devotees in perfected Gothic grandeur. Its royal and imperial palaces are of the oldest of the European dynasties. Its universities, colleges, academies of art, its hospitals and charities rival those of larger capitals. Its school of music is equaled only by that of Leipzig. Of course, it was little of all this magnificence, national and metropolitan, that we could see in the short period of four days. So again, Seward is moving quite rapidly during this leg of his journey in contrast to what we saw when he was in Asia. So by July 25th, Seward has arrived in Italy. What you'll see here is that we have many different Italian statues as part of our collection. They weren't all acquired by Seward on this trip in particular, but they are on display throughout the museum. Seward's first stop in Italy is Venice. He said, we expected to find Venice in a dilapidated and sinking condition. On the contrary, while a large number of its palaces and wards are empty and idle, there is at present a pervading air of activity and cheerfulness. Seward barely has time to really see Venice before he moves again two days later and arrives in Florence. By this point, Seward has traveled about 16,000 miles since he first departed San Francisco on the way to Japan almost a year prior to this. It is the middle of summer. Seward remarks that not many people are in Florence. Kings, ministers, members of the government have all departed. He's told that they've gone to Rome for official business, but Seward says that more likely they're just enjoying the mountains and the seaside. Seward says, the first impression we receive is that the edifices and dwellings of Florence are majestic and solemn, while the streets are broader, more perfectly paved, and cleanly kept than any others in the world. The next impression is that the people one meets are more gentle and accomplished than any other people. 
again only spending another two days in Florence and then he is off to his final stop this month which is Rome. Seward said the entrance into Rome, nay the very approach to it, is accompanied with an unpleasant feeling of the confusion of the ancient with the modern. In particular, Seward is commenting on the fact that he's seeing all of these ancient buildings and monuments, but also a good portion that have been transformed into more modern things like railway, railway stations. Seward, uh, his first order of business in Rome is to visit the Colosseum. He said, dinner cannot detain the traveler, however weary on the first day of his stay in the eternal city. Where do we go then? To the Colosseum. Where else could a stranger pass his first evening in Rome and that to a moonlit one? Seward had visited Rome about 10 years prior in 1859. During that time, he was running in America for the presidential nomination uh, on the Republican ticket. He was running against future president Abraham Lincoln. Obviously, Seward did not win the nomination nor become president, but in the middle of that campaign trail, Seward took off for Europe. He visited England where he met with Queen Victoria. He was again right here in Rome where he met with the Pope, and he also attempted to visit the Colosseum. Seward says now, 10 years later, when in Rome in 1859, a French soldier repulsed us from the gate at night because we had not an order of admission from the commandant of the French army of occupation. At the same time, a French bugler standing under the arch of the Temple of Peace on the opposite side of the street made the surrounding ruin echo with the notes of a French martial air. Um, the reason that he is mentioning the French military here is because 1859, Italy was engaged in the Second Italian War of Independence, um, or also known as the Franco-Austrian War. So that was France and Sardinia against the Austrian Empire and was an important step in the unification of Italy. So interesting, Seward is comparing these two visits um, in such a contrast between when he was denied entrance to the Colosseum to now 1871 when he is able to really properly bask in its magnificence. And this is where we are going to leave him at the end of July. And in August next month, we're going to pick back up right here in Italy. Seward will still be in Rome. And one of his first orders of business is to meet with the Pope. So see you next month and thanks for watching.